before I moved to Virginia 12 years ago, uh, I had a side job as a gardener, which I've told you about. I love gardening, so I did my pastoral job. I was the chaplain for 1,300 sheriff officers, and then I had a little selective lawn business on Mondays. And what I did uh, is I, I handpicked all of my jobs, So I because I, I didn't want to just do any kind of lawn. Uh, and so I basically uh, keyed on uh, very well-to-do homes, really nice landscapes, bushes worth trimming, uh, topiaries, the, the whole shebang. I wanted to invest my time in those things, and so I, so I did. Um, and uh, they paid me well uh, with what I knew about weed management from uh, a class I had had from UC Davis on that particular topic. Uh, and so I knew, knew quite a bit. So when they hired me, they're hiring my expertise. And plus, I didn't just, uh, you know, cut, you know, mow, blow, and go. I actually, <laughs> that's the statement of the city. I was an unusual uh, a gardener. Uh, the one lady's house in particular that I took care of, uh, she was kind of old money, downtown Stockton, huge mansion uh, where all the old mansion, mansions had been forever. Uh, she had a beautiful yard, huge front yard with a giant oak tree in front of it. Uh, I would come in the side drive uh, around by the giant swimming pool with Grecian statues all around it. I mean, it was nothing like my house. I mean, it was way beyond my home. Uh, and all I did at her house was take care of a rose garden. That's it. That's all she hired me for. She had another gardener for all the other things. She just hired me to take care of her 200 rose bushes. Easy job? Well, not really. I mean, it, I love roses and I love maintaining them. These, uh, the, these were a lot of fun. These, these were, uh, uh, they, they were perfectly planted in rows, hundreds of them. They were planted by color. So there was, you know, your reds and your oranges and your whites and uh, everything. I love the double delights, kind of a whitish, off-white color with a little pink here and there. Uh, I love that sector of the particular garden. So when I was finished taking care of her garden, all I did was walk around with a hula hoe uh, and a pair of, uh, of uh, pruners. That's it. Uh, and sometimes I might need a rake depending on what was there, but uh, I'd park my little truck and go around and take care of her garden. So when I was finished, uh, what do you think you would see when I would leave this rose garden after several hours? Do you think it would look cleaner? Yeah, oh yeah, 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 it was me doing it. So uh, you always want a type A gardener, right? So uh, it was uh, every, well manicured, raked, so there it was no weeds, nothing. Every, every plant was trimmed to perfection. I mean, I, I cut them, I knew how to cut them. I, I'd studied rose management and stuff because I had a rose garden at my house as well. Um, and so, you know, it was perfectly manicured to let the air in, to make the optimal roses, etc. I made strategic cuts, etc. cetera. Uh, so it was, like, it was like perfectly like symmetrical, this entire garden. Could you imagine if somebody came into there and said, hey, there, there's no gardener here. There's no way there's a gardener here. What was the proof that there was a gardener? No well, my truck's in the drive, <laughs> you know. No, there, all you had to do was look at it and see, there's no weeds. Uh, you, my goal was you couldn't find a dead branch. I mean, I cut off all the dead wood. It's totally cleaned, uh, you know, sprayed for disease, everything. You could just look at this and see from the symmetry and the care, there must be a master garden there. there. And there was. How foolish it would be to say, there is no gardener. Well, then how did this happen? Well, at this part of Stockton in the state of California, over random chance, over thousands of years, this just happened to occur. Uh, you would think that person is what? Crazy. <laughs> yeah, crazy. Uh, so when you look at that uh, particular analogy uh, in light of who God is, uh, there's evidences there was a master gardener there, me. There's also evidences that there's a master gardener, God, when you study the, that garden that he's made, which is the cosmos in which we live. And so uh, I'm excited about uh, this series. I slowed it down because it's so important. Uh, these, these, these arguments are very important. Why are, what are the evidences that there's a God? So we've studied three uh, concepts as we've moved through this. Um, we want to look first by way of review at argument number one. And remember what, what David said that God was going in the first place. Psalm 14 verse 1. What did David say? He says, this psalm that I've written is for the choir director at the temple. Uh, and the first thing that he says in this song, of which we don't have the notes anymore. We don't know how, how they sang it. The first thing it said when it opened up was, the fool has said in his heart, no God. I look around the cosmos, I don't see any proofs for God. And David says, as a thinking person, as a wise person, as a smart person, as a politician with, with power. He says, uh, no, it's the opposite of that. Uh, if you go to uh, Psalm 19, and we'll get there in, in a few weeks, uh, in Psalm 19 verse 1, he uses what we would call uh, the general revelation argument, that there is a God. All you got to do is look up to see it, from the complexity must be one who is highly complex. So what does he say in Psalm 19 verse 1? 
He says that the heavens above your head are telling the glory of God. You can see the glory of God's holiness emanating just by looking up at the heavens. Uh, he, he says, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. So if the cosmos is as expansive as it is, and they're always trying to find the edge of the ever-expanding cosmos, what's it expanding into? I mean, just the immensity of God. Uh, he says, the expanse, it declares the work of his hands. Uh, yeah, no doubt. He says, day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. So he said, if you want to you think about God's cosmos in the daytime, you want to do it at nighttime, it's constantly telling you he's there if you pay attention. That's the argument from general revelation. Uh, your Bible is special revelation, right? So we have two. So general revelation can lead a person at least to the God concept that there's a divine being who created him, which then should lead, if there is a divine being, then he could speak by definition. Which book is his book? That's a whole nother sermon series altogether. We're not gonna dive into that because you would never go home. So, it's better telling humor when there's people here but if you tell something humorous and they don't laugh, that's really bad. You know what I'm saying? So we, we're looking at general revelation, not special revelation. So if a person does not believe in the God concept, I'm not going to start with the Bible first. Why? Well, they don't believe in special revelation. Now, it doesn't mean the word of God's not powerful because Romans or Hebrews 4 says that sharp, that's sharper than a two-edged sword. So I'll eventually get there, but I'll start with them where they are. Why should you even believe that there is a God? So we've looked at uh, what we would call the evidence from causation, the law of causality, cause and effect. So we're reviewing here, all right? And if you were here the last two weeks and you don't know, don't know we're reviewing, I'll pray for you. We are, we're reviewing. So what's the evidence from causation? Cosmological argument, that's simple. Everything that exists has a cause, check. Uh, the universe had a beginning, check. What's the conclusion of the syllogism? It must have been a cause. I have two options for the cause. It was either personal or impersonal. For me personally, it seems more logical to say a person created the cause as opposed to an impersonal force created. How could an impersonal force create anything out of nothing? But anyway, that's a, the, the horizontal aspect of that argument. Number two, uh, that, so remember there was a big bang of sorts. So if, if there was a big bang, was there a big banger? That's the whole, you follow me? Yeah, now you understand what we're talking about. Uh, let's look at the, uh, the vertical aspect of this. So if there is a big banger, how do we get to that concept? Well, something exists. I do. I'm ontologically on the stage. I know I'm here. Uh, number two, nothing cannot produce something. That's absolutely logical truth. Three, therefore, something exists externally and it necessarily exists. Four, I am not necessary. Uh, and uh, I'm, an, I'm not an eternal being. Why? Because I change. An eternal being, by definition, cannot change. When it says God, God cannot change, if he could change, that me, means he needed improvement. Does God need improvement? No. No, he changes not. Therefore, thus both God, who is a necessary being, uh, and I, a contingent being, exist. That's theism. There is a God who's outside of our cause effect, who put it all in place and set it in motion, and he is not caused. So when your child asks you, mommy, who made God? What's the answer? No one made God. God is. Um, if you don't think these arguments are powerful, uh, they are extremely powerful because um, uh, I talked with a, a young 30-something-year-old man this week, raised in the church, went to his Christian school, and he realized that a couple of weeks ago after a cosmological argument, he did not know Christ. He did, he did not know God. And so after that cosmological uh, sermon, he got saved in his living room watching this online. So don't tell me that's not powerful. Uh, number two, we looked at last week at the evidence from design. So what does that argument say? All complex design implies a designer for logical minds. Two, the universe, especially life, has a complex design. What's a summation? Well, the universe must have a designer. Uh, sounds quite logical. Um, to believe other, to me, seems illogical. So years ago, the scientists who designed uh, plastic lenses for glasses, do you have glasses? And are they plastic? Yes, now my vision is 2800. So if I take my glasses off, I cannot see you. And in fact, if I take my glasses off, I can't even read what it says underneath the Psalms. And you can laugh, it's bad. I mean, I know it's bad. I can't see. So I'm, uh, my mother-in-law uh, was friends with the man who created plastic lenses. Yeah, yeah. 
He was in San Diego. And I remember having a conversation with him one day about plastic lenses. I'm like, thank you for making plastic lenses. Because I had to pay extra, you know, to get my lenses reduced down because they were so heavy if they're glass. You know what I mean? Like Coke bottles. You know what I'm saying? And so I, I thank the man. Uh, we were standing in the backyard uh, chatting, and I said, I, I don't know how you took plastic and made it to where it was the right power so I can see, but it has made my glasses much more pleasurable because you designed them in such a fashion that I can see most clearly, and they're, they're, they're not as heavy. So thank you. Whoever gets to talk to the designer? Now, what does this tell us? Uh, the more complex the design, the more complex the designer. See? Could you make plastic eyeglass lenses and see through them? No, no takers? Be very difficult, would it not? So when I look at things like that, uh, complex design, the, the complex design of an, a, a, p- a piece of gla- uh, plastic to made it to where we can see through that by a master designer, the scientist, pales into insignificance with the design of the eye. I mean, they're, they're not even similar. One calls for a designer. The other one as well, the eye calls for a designer. I think that's God. Now today what we're going to do is add another viewpoint, uh, viewpoint three. And these are not exhaustive by any stretch. Uh, these are just three of the main uh, evidences for God being in the garden. We want to look at morals, morality, the very thing that our culture is throwing to the wind. Morals are, in my estimation, one of the greatest arguments for the existence of God. Uh, it all starts with a question like this. How in the world did morals begin? Because we all believe they exist, do we not? You're thinking about it? You're the quietest audience of all time. Yeah. Uh, we all agree that morals exist. Uh, uh, in my estimation, it's very powerful. So what we're going to do is I'm going to start first with the theistic position of morality. Like how we believe that morals got there. And then we'll look at the anti-theistic position, which is what basically our culture is embracing. So Dr. Norman Geisler, uh, when I was in uh, doctoral school, put together this argument one day. It seemed almost logical to me. Here's, here's how it goes. Major premise. Every moral law has a moral law giver. They don't just happen out of thin air. Number two, uh, there is an objective moral law, and we all see it when we look at the cosmos. Conclusion, therefore, there must be an, a, an objective moral law giver who gave law. So, since we live in D.C., the epitome of law and order, correct? Uh, our legislators uh, devise laws, and they create these laws, and they vote on these laws, and they implement these laws of which we are to obey. None of us could say they happened out of thin air. There's, there's thousands of laws on the books. Uh, this was the very uh, argument that led uh, um, C.S. Lewis to Christ, to God. Because C.S. Lewis was an atheist. Uh, years ago, uh, I, I, I had a pastor who was retiring. His dad had been a pastor in, in uh, Europe. And then this man was, uh, uh, was an army chaplain. And he was, he was uh, retiring. And so when I was a 27-year-old pastor, uh, he had his dad's library and his library. Massive library. And he said, if you come to my house with your car, you can come into my uh, house and take as many books as will fit into your vehicle. Don't tell me there's not a God. At the time, I had a Chevy Caprice Classic. It was the size of the state of Arizona where I was. I gladly took him up on the offer. Glad I didn't have a Toyota Corolla. I drove out there. When it, he said, I'm going to leave because I can't emotionally watch this. It was very sad for him. And he had been a, a pastor as well to the deaf because he had a deaf son. So a great man of God. So, so this army, army chaplain left. I pulled my giant car up with a cavern of a, of, a, of a trunk, and I loaded, I mean, I was low riding all the way back to my house, so happy. A lot of my books came from this man. In those books were books that had been handed down from his father to him to me. There was a book, uh, I've never found it again. Uh, it's by C.S. Lewis. It's called The Case for Christianity. It's 56 pages. Uh, in this particular book, which I read years ago, uh, he tries to look at two concepts. Number one, He looks at right and wrong as a clue to the meaning of the universe. That's the first half of the book. The last half of the book, he looks at what Christians believe about that. Awesome book if you ever find it. Uh, He tells you in this little book uh, that his atheism disintegrated when he looked at the concept of absolute moral law that he could not get away from. Now, you're probably familiar with mere Christianity. 
uh, which has followed after this, which develops some of the arguments that are in this little small book. But if you want to read a small book straight to the point, this is a little easier to wrap your mind around if you can find it. Uh, and no, I will not sell you or loan you mine. Uh, anyway, it's not the Christian thing, right? Uh, here's what he says. He says, the moment that you say that one set of moral ideas can be better than another, you are in fact measuring them both by a standard. Saying that one of them conforms to that standard merely, uh, more nearly than the other. The minute you say that statement, my viewpoint is better than your point with morals, you're telling the other person there is a moral abstract standard above both of you that you're both appealing to. That's an absolute moral. Uh, he had a problem, as he says in the, in, if you read Mere Christianity, which I suggest that you should read, uh, he, he, he says as an atheist, he, during World War II, he says he hated the Nazis. He hated what the Nazis did uh, in Europe, etc. He hated what they did, but as an atheist, he began to wonder, why do I dislike the Nazis if I'm an atheist? Because if there's no absolute morals, the, the Nazis are just doing what they want to do based on their leadership. Why am I so incensed? Why, why am I so full of, of concern about justice? Here's what he says. He says, just had I, how had I got this idea of just and unjust? Where'd that come from? He says, a man does not call a, 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 lone, a, a, a line uh, crooked unless he can see a straight line. I mean, how do you measure it? Uh, he says, what was I comp comparing this universe to uh, when I called it unjust? Uh, he says, thus in the very act of trying to prove that God did not exist, in other words, that the whole of reality was just senseless, as an atheist, I found I was forced to assume that one part of reality, namely the idea of justice, was full of sense. He had a tension. He had a problem. On the one hand, he's believing that we were just we're a product of blind randomness of matter. And on the other, he's, he's full of concepts of justice, of right and wrong. Where did that come from? That tension is what led him to God. Because that concept of moral law above him told him what he ought to do. What he ought to do. Uh, this is what moral law tells you. You might choose how you want to live, but in the back of your mind is your conscience telling you what you ought to do. Now, I took 10 years of piano. Um, <laughs> my, my piano teacher was very rigid. Uh, it was big on fingering, big on timing, the whole thing. I mean, you had to play that piece by whoever, Mozart, Bach, whatever, as written. She'd watch your hands, your fingers. Uh, and I was not your most cooperative student. Because as I got better after year six and seven, I would kind of play around with Mozart. So I would change things, modify them, change the fingering. And, and if I did a run differently than how he wrote it, she would stop me. What are you doing? Oh, I'm kind of feeling like I just want to do this. And she said, well, you can't do it that way. Uh, he didn't put that trill in there. Well, it sounded good. Uh, but if I read the piece, the piece told me what I ought to do, Correct. And I, by free will, was kind of doing my own thing, driving my poor uh, piano teacher uh, crazy. See, God, God puts in us this, this concept of law that transcends all of us. And, and Lewis saw the tension. He can say, I'm an atheist all day long, but he knows in the back of his mind there's an oughtness about his life. There ought to be justice. Uh, how do we know that there's just this, this, this concept of uh, moral law in the cosmos? Uh, Dr. Geisler gives us uh, several things to think about uh, to show to us that we all believe uh, that there is moral truth. Here's what he says. And you can think about his uh, concepts here. He says, number one, we would not know that there's injustice unless there was an objective standard of justice. Two, True progress, moral progress, is not possible unless we know an objective standard by which to measure that. Absolutely true. Three, things are getting better or worse because we have a standard by which to measure movement. So, you know, I was born in 57. So I, as I look at my culture and I watch what's happening in my culture, I can say safely as I watch it, it's not better than it was. It's disintegrating at rapid speed, morally speaking. Uh, number four, moral, uh, real moral disagreements are not possible without an objective moral standard. Five, the same basic moral codes are found in most cultures. There's some deviation, but the general concepts of morality permeate all cultures. Six, guilt from breaking a moral law would not be universal if there were no objective moral law. Seven, even those who deny moral absolutes have moral principles they believe are universal, such as tolerance, freedom of expression, and the wrongness of bigotry and genocide, etc. S number eight, he says, we did not invent moral law uh, any more than we invented mathematical or physical laws. We discovered it. 
Like the laws of logic. Did Aristotle invent logic? No. What did he do? He discovered logical principles. Same thing when it comes down to moral law. We didn't invent it. We discovered those transcendent truths. Number nine, we sometimes choose duty to, to save a drowning person over instinct, not to risk our own life. What's, where's that duty come from? Because the instinct tells you in a bad situation, you, you better flee. So to me, like one of the most amazing things that you can read about is when a soldier sees a grenade drop near his buddies and what does he do? Jumps on the grenade and absorbs it for his friends. See, that's that oughtness. What does instinct tell you to do? See a grenade? Run, jump out of the foxhole, whatever. But what does duty tell you? I must absorb that for my friends to save them. Where does that come from, that oughtness? Well, it's built into the fabric of the cosmos. 10, the basic moral law is discovered not, not by how we behave, but by how we desire others to behave toward us. This is interesting. I'll read it again. Basic moral law is discovered based on how we behave and how we want people to behave toward us. So, uh, see, people will say in our culture, just to put the cookies on the lower shelf, they'll say things like this. No human is illegal. You heard this? No human is illegal. Now, my father was a U.S. Customs uh, port uh, supervisor. Uh, and he spent his whole life in customs. I lived on the border. I'm quite familiar with the laws. What is this telling you? There's no boundaries. There's no nations. Anybody, anybody's free to go anywhere. Uh, no human is illegal. Uh, that sounds really great. Sounds really loving and kind. But if a person makes that statement that no human is illegal, that you can traverse whatever boundary that you want to, then all you have to do to sh prove their premise is wrong, that there is absolute law and they believe it, is, is take your camper over to their house, park it in their driveway, hook up to their electricity, borrow their water, and say you're here to stay for an indefinite period of time. How are they going to respond? They're going to say, uh, you're trespassing. This is my property. You don't belong here. All of a sudden now, I'm illegal, right? And so it's the breakdown of our culture, making these nice statements, but they're not wedded to reality because even in the temple of God, there were parameters. There was only one person that could go inside the Holy Holies once per year. That was the high priest. And if anybody else went in there, God would say to them, you're illegal. And what would happen to them, by the way? Yeah, they get vaporized. In fact, when the high priest went in there on the Day of Atonement, they tied a rope to his ankle as they let him walk in there. And if he happened to have sin about him and God took him out because he traversed a boundary of holiness, they had to drag him out. I am glad I was not around back then coming to church. Just saying. Uh, so true objective moral law is written into the warp and woof of the cosmos. We all see it. We all see it. Then, then where did it come from? Here's what Paul says in Romans 2. Uh, he says, for all have sinned in, without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law, the Torah, do instinctively the things of the law, because it's built into their being, those not having the law are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written where? It's in their heart. They can't get away from God's moral law. Their conscience bearing witness when they break the law. Uh, and their thoughts alternatively accusing or else defending them. One uh, on the day when according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. The day is coming when the moral lawgiver, God will say, I'm gonna judge you as the moral lawgiver in relationship to how did you respond to moral law? The Christian's viewpoint, very important. Uh, we will give account one day. I believe we will give account. And God will want to know, did you subvert my law or do you submit to my law? Because if you su submit to my law, that means that you saw me and you worshiped me. And if you subverted my law, you did not know me and you'll be judged accordingly. That's a Christian viewpoint. There is a God who gave us moral law. What's the opposite of that? Well, that's the anti-theistic position. Those who deny the existence of God, uh, here's how their argument runs. Major premise. Maybe you've heard these at work from people spouting these off. Uh, there are moral imperfections in the world. Do you believe that? Are there moral imperfections? Right? You, you probably had a few when you came to church this morning. A couple of imperfections, okay? Uh, uh, like, we could relate it to driving because everybody understands driving. Uh, I know it's painful, but I mean, if you think about it, I mean, so... So I have a new car now that it actually projects the speed out in front of you onto the hood. Uh, 
And it does. I mean, it's really weird. And it's, and it's out there. And so I was driving uh, and the other day, and it projects out there what the speed limit is. Say, say it's 55. So if you're going 65, it starts flashing on your screen in front of you. You just want to hit a button and turn the thing off. Because yeah. yeah, you're feeling carnal that day. But it's beep, 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 beep. You know, it's just, it's just flashing. So, so we all know that there's moral imperfections in the world. And by the way, don't buy a car that does that to you. It'll freak you out. Uh, so number two, the minor premise, a morally perfect God would not allow moral imperfections. And then last, therefore, they say there's no morally perfect God because there's moral imperfections. Uh, I believe in point one, absolutely. People are sinful, evil. But I don't believe in number two. Why? Because God gave us a free will. And he gave us a free will to say yes or no to him, to the law that he built into the cosmos. And so uh, the problem uh, with their viewpoint uh, as an atheist who takes this viewpoint uh, is, uh, is erroneous because they're not looking at what God has really done. He's created us and he's given us moral law and the free will to either obey it or not obey it. But an atheist that, uh, who blindly accepts uh, evolutionary thinking that we are just a product of random blind chance. Uh, this position is very difficult for him for where, does his, where do his morals come from? Uh, this is not exhaustive, but I'll get you the, give you the three places their morals come from if there is no God. Francis Crick uh, once said, as a scientist, quote, the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their isolated molecules are, are the, the essence of our moral actions. Translated, what did he just say? A, you get pulled over by the police officer because that thing was flashing on your dash and you're way over the speed limit. You roll down the window and you tell him, hey, those officer, those were my genes in action. Mm-hmm. What's going to happen to you? You're going to get a ticket. I mean, you're going to get a ticket as surefire as one of my friends in high school got pulled over in his VW bug. He was a football player. His name was Chuck. He got pulled over. The police officer came into the window, said, son, you were, you were speeding. Uh, and, he, and he said, as the guy opened his pad to write the ticket, and my friend said this, I'll have two eggs over easy with a side of ham. <laughs> How do you think that went for Chuck? Not well. Not well. Uh, so, uh, this is why it's, it's just in my genes. My genes were doing that. Really? That's interesting. Um, there's another viewpoint where we get the morals from. Uh, we do what is best for society. That's our culture. It's what the collective says is the best. That's what we do, morally speaking. And if you don't fit into that, well, you have to merge to our viewpoint. Uh, there's another viewpoint. That's, that's called normative relativism. We do what is the norm of the culture. Uh, three, in individual uh, ethical relativism is, uh, well, I don't just do what the culture says. I do what I want to do. I'm a law to myself. Uh, where do you think we are as a culture? Well, we're heavily into item two and three. Uh, let's analyze these quickly. What's wrong with view one? Uh, I think everybody locked up in a prison system would love view one. Wouldn't you? I mean, when I was a sheriff chaplain and they would take me into the prison and I'd see all the prisoners and when I did uh, services for felons, etc., they would love view one as they, as they went before the judge. You know, one of my friends is a, was a judge, at, well, he still is a judge, superior court judge, uh, but uh, when they would bring these prisoners before him, when the prisoners would ask me to pray for them and they would, they would and I would tell them, who's going to be your judge this week when you go before the judge? When they would tell me uh, the name of my friend, it's basically not worth prayer. It's over. I mean, he was major into law, uh, but I would pray for him. Uh, so view one was probably quickly thrown out because there's no way that thing is going to hang together. Uh, it is not logically true. We are morally responsible for the things that we take, take our, as, as free will actions. And when you do something that's wrong, you can't get away from your conscience. It's built into your brain. Two, uh, it sounds great to say that I'm only doing what the society tells me to do, uh, but suppose your society changes what is moral truth, which is what's happening in our culture. Things that used to be moral truth based on Judeo-Christian thinking, timeless moral truths, are now being trashed and overthrown by things that are moral truths. What do we do? Well, I don't embrace these new moral truths because I believe in absolute moral truth. Uh, think about uh, Hitler and the Nazis. You have one type of German culture prior to World War I. After World War II, you have a completely different uh, German culture. They could have just said as an officer, I was at Auschwitz only doing what they told me to do. Right? That's what our culture said we are to do. 
not a viable argument. We were able to try those uh, soldiers, and I think they, they just uh, found another one this week, a 90-something-year-old uh, man who had been a soldier uh, at, a, at a concentration camp. We can still judge them years after the fact. Why? Because there's transcendent truth that thou shalt not murder an innocent person. So that viewpoint begins to fall apart. Sounds good, but it doesn't work in the practical when your culture goes south on you. View three, it's where we are as a nation. Uh, it's, it's relativism. Uh, it is I do what, what I want to do uh, because I am a law unto myself. Uh, and so what we do as a culture is we, we allow everything to be true uh, except for those things that we don't like, like Christianity. And so what they do uh, is they are trying to prove their position uh, by assuming the basis of my position. So once they say there's no moral law that's absolute, their position is absolute. They have now proved my point. That is the culture in which we live. If you live in a culture like that that throws moral law to the wind, you have what happened at the end of the period of the judges. What happened? It says in Judges uh, chapter 21 verse 25, in those days there was no king in Israel and everyone did that which is right in their own eyes. Moral chaos. Without moral transcendent truth based on God, then morals become whatever man wants them to be and society disintegrates by definition. What did Paul say in uh, Psalm 14, the rest of the passage? He tells us, uh, if you abandon God, what happens? He tells you. He says, they, people who abandon God, are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. Uh, there is no one who does good when you abandon God. He says, the Lord has looked down from heaven up on the sons of man to see if there are, are those who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Paul is going to pick this passage up and, and, and articulate it in Romans 3 about man's spiritual condition. He is by definition hostile to God and by definition throws more, God's moral law to the wind. And it says here, God pays attention. He watches what people do. The base form of the, the moral argument uh, is uh, extremely important to highlight and I will give you the base form of the argument. Um, once a person assumes relativism, relativism is true, is absolutely true, has by definition defeated their argument because they've shown that morals can be absolute is what you are claiming. Um, number two, a Christian apologist, his name is uh, Paul Copen, uh, has written extensively about moral law. And I'll just share with you a couple quotes from him which are very astute. Here's what he says. He says, how do we move uh, from uh, a universe that originates from no prior matter into a universe of valueless matter and energy, eventually arriving at moral values, including human rights, human dignity, and moral obligation. He says, it's hard to see how the naturalist could bridge that chasm. Matter, he says, does not have moral properties, let alone mental ones. How'd you do that, he said. How'd you go from valueless matter to we are highly value, valuable uh, in the cosmos? How did that originate? Uh, he's going to argue it's better to originate in the hand of God than valueless matter. He says, if moral facts are just brute givens and are necessarily true, there's left unexplained a huge cosmic coincidence between the existence of these moral facts and the eventual emergence of morally responsible agents who are obligated to them. Uh, I'm going to opt for a personal being created everything and set morals in place because he's the absolute moral of all morals. Common sense. Common sense. It doesn't mean that you can't argue against these viewpoints. I could if I wanted to, because I've read and studied the arguments. They're not airtight, but they seem more logical than the options given on the other side. I introduce you to uh, Jay Budzizewski as we close. Great man. Uh, he's a professor at the University uh, of Texas in Austin. Uh, he is one of my favorite people to read. He, he will stretch your thinking uh, to new levels. Uh, when he started his scholastic uh, schooling, uh, he got a BA in political science from the University of, uh, of uh, Florida. And he also got a, a master's degree in political science from the University of Florida. 1981, uh, he got a PhD in political science from, Le from Yale. And all through that, he was an atheist. All through it. But he had a problem with his atheism, his, his concept that there is no God. And I'll share with you the tension that he felt like C.S. Lewis. Here's what he said. He says, what actually led me back was uh, to God, he says, is a growing intuition that my condition was objectively evil. Evil is a deficiency in good. There's no such thing as an evil substance uh, and, and evil in and of itself. 
So if my condition really was evil, there had to be some good of which my condition was the ruination. What did he just say? How could I objectively say there's evil, which he could sense, if it did not exist? Same thing C.S. Lewis is saying. That tension in his life as an atheist, that he said there's, there's some, something going on here that's objective and moral, and I sense it, led him to the feet of Christ. Became a great believer. Now he's a professor uh, teaching university students uh, uh, on that campus uh, of how do we know what we know about God. Uh, that, by the way, is an excellent book about moral law and, and, and thinking about God just from the cosmos. Uh, we see a young man here who now is an older man who knew, came to God by means of the moral law. David says in Psalm 14 what we should do in light of what we see as God's fingerprints. Notice what he says in Psalm 14. He says, do all the workers of wickedness not know? I mean, translated, are they clueless? He says, who eat up my people as if they eat up bread and, and they don't call up on the Lord? It says, they, uh, there they are in great dread, uh, for God is with the righteous generation. You would put to shame the counsel of the afflicted, but the Lord is his refuge. Uh, David stops and says, the fool who says there's no God, he's in grave danger. Why? God's watching his foolishness with morality. And one day he'll have to give account for that. You can either stand before God covered by the, the, the blood of Christ and forgiven by that moral lawgiver who came to fulfill the law, or you will stand there on your own with all your arguments that shall not save you. Uh, I know two people that we've mentioned today, they're going to stand there free. C.S. Lewis, covered by the blood of Christ. Uh, J. Budzeski will stand there one day free uh, because he understood that law, that cosmology, that design, and that moral law all pointed to a living God who had, had revealed himself through the scriptures. Uh, I pray that God would reveal himself to you. Uh, and I pray that you as Christians would study these arguments to share with them uh, to people who don't know the Christ so they too can come to know him, the God who created them. Let's pray. God, thank you. You do stretch our thinking in many ways. Uh, you use special revelation to deepen us in our understanding of who you are. You use general revelation uh, to lovingly guide us uh, to your feet to consider who you are and why you made us. Thank you for the proofs you've embedded that you did not disclose yourself in such a way that uh, we don't even have a chance to use free will to choose you. And you are not so hidden, we could search in a lifetime and never find you. You in all wisdom have clearly uh, and lovingly placed your arguments there, your proofs uh, to guide us to you. And we thank you for that. May people in our body be saved because they follow the evidence to your feet. In Jesus' name, amen.